Hello everyone, welcome to Introduction to Quantum Computing. Now before we get started on the quantum, we need to say something about classical computing, because the comparisons always come up between quantum computing and classical computing. Now I say the word classical instead of what you see on the screen, which is digital, because that's the convention now in the community to refer to digital computing as classical. The reason actually comes from physics. So in 1900, scientists were trying to explain some new data that they were seeing and they couldn't use, or they could try to use, but it wasn't working, the conventional physics of the time which would be the physics of Newton um, and Maxwell and others. And they used a new kind of physics, which eventually became called quantum physics, to explain this data. So prior to 1900, of course, it was just called physics. But after quantum mechanics, the physics of Newton became known as classical physics and all the stuff that came after would be modern physics. And modern physics include, uh, modern physics includes quantum physics, of course, but also general relativity. But let's, let's not consider general relativity in this course, since so far as I know, nobody's come up with the idea of using gravitation or space-time to do computations, at least not in any practical sense. So we will talk about quantum physics versus classical physics. Now, in a sense, quantum physics is more general than classical physics, so you can derive classical physics from uh, quantum mechanics. And so it, in some sense, uh, it has overtaken classical physics. So we have modern physics, which is quantum physics, and then pre-modern physics, which would be Newton, is called classical physics. So that term classical comes from the history of physics, and in 1980, several people came up with the idea of building a quantum computer, which would be different than uh, computers that were used at the time, and of course still used today, which are digital computers. And in a sense, quantum computing killed digital computers by fiat and just calling them classical, as if they're pre-modern, which of course they're not, uh, because it's not that after 1980, people started thinking about only quantum computers as if they were strictly superior to classical computers. In fact, you are taking the subject in the School of Computer Science. Um, the vast majority of the people who work in the School of Computer Science are classical, or just they would call themselves just computer scientists, and a few of us are quantum computer scientists. So uh, still mostly classical, but some quantum. So when we talk about comparing this new model of computation to the uh, previous model, we say quantum and classical, but it's not that classical computation is just to be replaced by quantum computation. Another interesting just fact is that, of course, quantum physics was known for a long time before digital computers um, started to become uh, useful, and we wouldn't have the computers that we have today if not for our understanding of quantum physics. So in order to understand the transistors um, in the device that I'm writing this on, the device that you're viewing it on, required knowledge of, of quantum physics. Okay, uh, but in some sense, there's, uh, there, there, there is a stronger connection uh, of digital computers to classical physics. Now, 
yes, we have these miniaturized uh, devices with billions of transistors, but in order to perform those computations, they don't have to be miniature. They don't have to be transistors. This could all be done with the you know, giant machines made of uh, woods and bolts and pulleys and levers. It would just be, well, it would, who knows how big it would need to be, but certainly far bigger than would be practical. But thinking about that really emphasizes the fact that digital computers uh, behave according, if we're thinking about them physically, behave according to the laws of classical physics. So the comparison is maybe more, more fair than, than you might think. Uh, classical computers you know, in principle could be built with devices that only require knowledge of classical physics, whereas quantum computers will require quantum mechanics to understand. Okay, so the data that is stored in our classical computers is then called classical data. And that is, of course, as you probably already know, just sequences of zeros and ones, or can be represented as such. And those are bits. So I have some bit string. Maybe that's encoding, representing, I don't know, some sort of tweet or TikTok video. Hashtag well. Uh, now, these devices seem to be all the same. I mean, on the outside, they look different. Of course, and the Apple fanboy will tell you that it's very different. Of course, when you take them apart, they're all pretty much the same. And in a very formal sense, they are. When you have lots of things that are the same, you can have a prototypical example of such. And in computer science, this is called a Turing machine. Uh, I've drawn it like a modern computer, but it doesn't really matter. The idea is there's some device that you can describe that is uh, universal. So uh, it can simulate any other device. And uh, that device is called a Turing machine. It's related to, or used in, the statement of the Church Turing thesis, which formalizes what I just said. And that is that All physics, uh, all physical phenomena, all things in the world can be simulated, can be simulated by a Turing machine. Okay. And there is another version of this that's called the extended church Turing thesis. And it, the statement is the same, and it just adds one word, which is that can be done. Moreover, it can be done efficiently. Okay, so that has a technical definition, and throughout this subject, there we'll have the opportunity to uh, understand the technical details of all of these definitions, but I'll just give you a flavor of it now. So imagine I give you some task, count to 10. I don't mind writing those all out, it doesn't take very long. But now, say I asked you to count to 1,000. Well, that's going to take much longer. In fact, I'm going to have to count to 10, and then count to 10, and then count to 10, and I'm going to have to do that 100 times until I get to 1,000. So counting, this takes 100 times as long. So in the number of digits I want to count to, so a thousand has four digits, uh, the task of counting grows exponentially. It's not efficient.
Okay. However, if I just want to write down the number that you asked me to count to, that one only takes two times as long because there's twice as many digits. So this task of writing down a number is efficient. And this is all stated relative to the size of the input, which is the number you want me to count to or write down, uh, the number of digits in that number. Okay, so um, all the, the statement of the church Turing thesis is one that's using this notion of efficiency. So it says that you know, as I add more particles in my universe that I want to simulate, then the Turing computer can continue to simulate that efficiently. So adding one more particle uh, doesn't take, doesn't uh, double or you know, the, the complexity of simulating that isn't going to grow exponentially in the number of particles in my universe that I want to simulate. Okay, uh, and this is of course useful if you want to think about building machines to solve problems. So uh, you'll notice that most of the computers are all relatively the same. They all can do pretty much the same thing. And this is all rel you know, related to this idea of there being a universal device. And if I have a problem that I want to solve and my computer can't do so efficiently, then there's no sense in building a new kind of device that might be able to do it efficiently. Why is that? Well, if all physics can be simulated with one of these devices, then of course I could use that device to simulate what this new potential computer is going to do. And if it could solve it efficiently, then the original device could simulate the computer solving it efficiently. So it would also solve the problem efficiently. So there's no point in building a new machine if you've proven that the problem cannot be done efficiently. Now the church, the extended church Turing thesis is probably wrong, it's probably incorrect. And that's all because of, let's go back to the fancy one. Quantum. So quantum physics, as far as we can tell, cannot be simulated efficiently on a digital computer using a Turing machine. So a Turing machine probably can't simulate uh, the quantum mechanical universe efficiently. In fact, maybe with all of the computing power that we have in the world today, we might be able to get up to, uh, you know, a, a very small molecule that we want to simulate. And if we add just one more small degree of freedom, then we need two Earths worth of computers. And another one would require four Earths, and that would grow exponentially. So around 1980, people started to think about this problem. Could, uh, could the extended church Turing thesis be wrong? Uh, could, uh, and if, we don't, if a universal Turing machine can't simulate quantum physics, maybe we need to build or think about a new kind of machine, and that would be a universal quantum computer. And that's what we're going to get to next.